I want to share a, a story with you that recently had a profound impact on me. In 2009, uh, a couple by the name of Reed and Kyra Carr, they moved from Louisville, Kentucky over to Rome, Italy uh, to serve Christ there as missionaries and church planners. Uh, Rome is a city known for its religion and spirituality but is devastatingly void of the true gospel. And that's what motivated them to go. Now, Reed began serving as an assistant pastor uh, at a local church plant alongside a gentleman named Leonardo Di Chirico. He's a, a pastor and a writer whose ministry I, I appreciate tremendously. Uh, when Pastor Leonardo asked them what their dreams and intentions were for serving in Italy, Reed and Kyra told him that they believed God was calling them to serve long term. They knew that ministering in a, in a context dominated for so many centuries by the institution of the Roman Catholic Church, that, that would require a lifetime of service, uh, if not more. And so they, they told Pastor Leonardo, uh, we intend to live and to die in Italy in order to make the gospel known. The impact of an 18-wheeler smashing into their vehicle made that a crushing reality far sooner than they had hoped. They were on furlough back here in the States when a semi-truck T-boned them, sent their vehicle across the median, across the uh, other traffic and slamming into a guardrail. And Kyra, Reed's treasured wife and mother of his three little girls, had died on impact. And Reed wrestled understandably wrestled with whether to return to Italy or to go back home where family could help care for the girls. Uh, the thought of staying in Italy, he said, just seemed insurmountable. But over time, God changed Reed's perspective. Uh, and he moved in his heart and Reed decided to go back to Rome and continue serving Christ there. Reed's return was such a powerful testimony to the grace of God and to the worth of the gospel that it made an eternal impact on many. Uh, not only was the church greatly encouraged and edified and built up, but people began coming to Christ because of his witness. Most notably, there was a couple named Luca and Helena whom Reed and Kyra had, had been ministering to. They'd befriended them. They were their neighbors, and they were seeking to win them to Christ. Luca and, and Helena, they said, Reed's witness helped us, moved us to become followers of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, and they're now a part of that local congregation. Uh, Helena said that Reed's joy in Christ amidst such sorrow was utterly impossible if there wasn't a true God. If, there, if you didn't have faith in Jesus, that's impossible to do what he did. And Luca, the husband, said that life used to be all about him. And he said, but because of Reed and Kyra, God is now in and over every moment of his life. Now that's one of countless stories throughout the ages that proves what was true of the church in Acts chapter two is true of the church throughout the ages and true today. That is that devoted disciples have a winsome witness and can make an incredible impact. See, impact, that's a word that you probably heard several times because I used it at least six times, five or six times in that statement. Impact is a word that denotes objects coming forcibly together, uh, almost like a collision that has a strong and sometimes lasting effect. And the pattern of Reed and Kyra's story was that the impact of a semi-truck upon their car so drastically impacted their lives. Yet because the gospel had so deeply impacted Reed, he returned to Italy where his winsome witness had an incredible and profound impact upon people even Luca and Helena. And hopefully, upon hearing that story, it has even impacted you. 
See, as we close our study in Acts 2, our focus this morning is on the incredible impact that devoted disciples can have on others. The incredible impact. Last week, we looked at the impact of our devotion on us and saw that a winsome witness is one that is comprised, marked by uh, unity, joy, sincerity, and praise. And today, we want to talk about the impact of our witness on other people. Now, I'm not aware of a, of a true Christian or a true church, and I'm sure that it is true of you if you're following the Lord Jesus. I'm not aware of anybody who follows Christ that doesn't want to make some kind of incredible impact for him. To have an impact on others for Christ is the goal of our lives as we follow him, to glorify him and to bring others to glorify him. As we approach this morning, I want to show you that the, the way in which we go about making an impact is significant, can even determine the quality. But we'll consider a little bit more of that later. What I want to show you this morning is a group of devoted disciples who became a compelling community of winsome witnesses and had an incredible impact on souls around them. And I want to exhort each one of us and us collectively as a body uh, to follow in their steps, that God might use us to make an incredible impact. We'll center our thoughts around three words, fear, favor, and follow. Three favor, <laughs> that was three, three words, fear, favor, and follow. Might be like some of your report cards when you were younger, three Fs right there. <laughs> Fear, favor, and follow. We'll see that as we go. So let's consider the first way the church made an impact in regard to fear. Verse 43 says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, as the church blossomed, their testimony invoked a respectful trepidation among the people. Uh, the word awe in the ESV is phobos, which sounds like what? phobia, like a fear. And it means to be frightened or alarmed, filled with fear. And what it means in this context is not so much of a wow, but more of a whoa, whoa, wait a sec. See, the people, the people feared because they realized that God was in the midst of this new community. And Luke makes that clear for us by, by connecting the people's fear to the supernatural work of God. At the end of the verse, it says, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, we don't have time to kind of detail a, a theology of signs and wonders through the book of Acts, as exciting as that might be. What I want you to notice, though, is one key truth. I want you to see that signs weren't meant to be the focus but were meant to confirm the apostles' authority, to validate their message about Jesus, and to point to people, to, uh, point people to Jesus. You know, signs in themselves, church, are, are meant to point beyond themselves. Um, nobody sits at the McDonald's parking lot under those glowing arches with their mouths wide open, waiting for those delicious fries to just fall down from heaven. The purpose of that sign is to direct you to the location, which is the source of that deliciousness. But you now have to stop gazing at the sign and walk into the store and order those fries. The sign's purpose was to point. And that's the same here. Supernatural signs done through the apostles, they were to point beyond themselves to the Lord who was the authority and power and focus of their message and ministry. Now, like, um, like Jesus, maybe I'd say this was similar to Jesus' message and ministry. You know, in Luke uh, 7, 16, it's talking about um, signs and miracles. Jesus just healed the widow's son, brought him back from the dead. And Luke says this, he says, fear, phobos, seized them all and they glorified God saying, God has visited his people. See, those miracles, the miracles and signs marking Jesus' message and ministry were to confirm that Emmanuel was here. God with us. God was here. 
and the apostles as Christ's witnesses were performing the same kinds of signs and miracles and wonders and, and, and they served the same goal. Not to cause people to go, hey, wow, that's pretty cool, right? Even Simon um, the sorcerer, I think in Acts 8, he says, tell me what I need to do to do signs like that. No, not the case. It was to cause people to go, whoa, Emmanuel. God is here in the midst of this community. And the people around the church took a nervous notice. Well, the question becomes, how does all this apply to us today? I think it's a valid question to ask whether or not our message and ministry should be accompanied by these types of miraculous signs and wonders that after I preach the message, I should just heal all of you. You know, something should mark it. Is that true? Well, that's a, that's a good question, a valid question, but it's not the best question because again, it points, uh, it puts the emphasis on the signs, not on the God to whom those signs are pointing. So the real question for us to answer this morning is this. Can other people look at your life, look at our church, and say, whoa, God is in their midst? Can people in Billings say that? Can your neighbors say that? See, we are a supernatural people who still minister in the miraculous, but we often downplay what's miraculous. It's not about revival services and healings and prophecies and Bible codes. You don't need Sid Roth to tell you that it's supernatural because it's supernatural when God's word is is faithfully preached, when it is humbly believed by faith, when it is joyfully observed, and when it is eagerly proclaimed to other people. I mean, all of us know it is a miracle for any church to be marked by unity, let alone joy, sincerity, and praise. It's it's supernatural when a husband treasures his wife as Christ loves the church, when parents discipline out of love instead of wrath and anger and indignation. It's supernatural when a woman who desires a husband says, no, I am content in Christ and seeks that joy found only in him. It's miraculous when a young man who's rages, whose desires rage within him says, no, I'm going to rage against that and I'm going to put on purity. It is miraculous when people who are gripped by materialism all of a sudden become gripped by the generosity of God and their hands become open to the needs of the saints. It's miraculous when people with tear-stained cheeks experience the comfort and compassion of the Savior. That's, that's supernatural. That's supernatural. So here's your application for the week. Give somebody a reason to be afraid. Be very afraid. (laughs) Give somebody a reason to fear like this. Abide with Christ so faithfully. Love him so passionately, praise him so freely that somebody would come up to you and go, whoa, God is in that person's midst. What what is going on there? It has to be God. Well, that's the first way that their winsome witness made an incredible impact. The second way is that the people favored. The people feared, the people favored. Look at verse 46. It says, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, here you go, and having favor with all the people. The favor here means that these believers lived in such a winsome and attractive way that they earned the respect of the unbelieving community around them. You know, enjoying the favor of people is is, is sometimes vital to accomplishing the task that you've been given. And we know this because you could just ask any law enforcement officer now serving in 2018, and they would tell you exactly that. See, in the last few years, the the fear and respect of of officers has plummeted to an all-time low. 
with each video of an officer uh, mistreating or, or fatally wounding somebody, justified, unjustified, racially motivated, un, irregardless of those things, each video, any misstep that went viral threw gasoline on the fire of doing away with fear and respect of law enforcement. And it created a storm across the nation. You know, but, but over time, social media that was once filled with uh, intense debate about black lives, blue lives, and all lives suddenly became flooded with videos of police officers on duty demonstrating sincere acts of kindness. Have you guys seen some of those videos? Yeah. Some of them that I've seen, officers in full uniform playing games of pickup basketball, having breakdancing competitions with people, uh, reading books to little kids on the steps. I even saw one officer who was shaving a, a man's face so that he could go have a job interview. So the actions of, of, of some have been detrimental, yes, but many have been and currently are working uh, to regain the favor of the people to promote goodwill and have a good reputation so that they can carry out the task they've been given. The church, having favor with the people, a, a good reputation is is a major part of the church accomplishing the task that she's been assigned, the one that we sang about that's unfinished. Uh, just to calm your fears, you can put your stones in your pocket. I'm not talking about being people pleasers. I'm not talking about being ear ticklers who avoid saying the hard truths about God's word because we don't want to be offensive. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the gospel is offensive to sinners already, and I want you and I to live in such a way that we wouldn't be the offense. That's what we're talking about. Living in such a way that would cause people to fear where they would say, whoa, God is in their midst, but would also cause people to favor and say, wow, I sure enjoy being in their midst. People like Karen who would say, why do, we, why do we cut our song so short? Why does the preacher stop so soon? See, the, the Bible does promise that devoted disciples will experience consequences for following Jesus. The rest of Acts testifies to this. 2 Timothy 3.12 says that all who desire to live godly lives will be persecuted. You can take that promise to the bank. But... A few verses before that in 2 Timothy 2, God reminds us this, church. Compassionate evangelism is not compromise. Can you hear that? Compassionate evangelism is not compromise. In fact, it's his will for his church. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 25 says that the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with harshness? No, gentleness, that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Church, I'm afraid that we've allowed passages about persecution and how the world is supposed to hate us for following Jesus. We've, we've allowed it to overshadow the fact that we are called to have a good reputation among unbelievers. I think that we as Christians can sometimes justify our offensive behavior by, by pointing to the Bible and saying, well, I'm, I'm just suffering for the gospel's sake. That might be true, that might be true. But to be arrogant, judgmental, demeaning, or abrasive is not suffering for the gospel. In fact, you're suffering because you deserve it for acting like that. If that's the way you're gonna evangelize, please don't say you go to Cornerstone Community Church. <laughs> Dead serious. Please don't. Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. 
He's talking about unbelievers. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. In other words, just as salt enhances the flavor of food, so too salty speech, um, salty, winsome, favorable lives can cause unbelievers, other people to crave the truth that we're preaching. And that was true of Jesus as well. Luke 2.52 says that Jesus grew in favor, same word, with men. You say, Pastor, are you reading the same Bible I'm reading? Jesus got crucified. (laughs) That doesn't sound like favor with men. True. But our lives, the fact that we are here worshiping Jesus, serving Jesus, loving Jesus, points to the fact that 2 Timothy 2 is absolutely true of Jesus, who is the Lord's servant, who uh, was not quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, who was able to teach, who did patiently endure evil, particularly our evil, our sin, we crucified him. He corrected his opponents with gentleness that God might perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And you and I are proof of that. For we ran a hellbound race indifferent to the cost. And yet he looked upon our helpless state and he led us to the cross. And it was at the cross where we beheld God's love displayed. The fact that Jesus would suffer in our place that he bore the wrath deserved and reserved for me, the wrath that I'd earned. And now all I know is grace. (laughs) Jesus has won my favor. (laughs) He's won my affection. I think he's won yours. He's won our worship, which we all used to give elsewhere. And he did it with a winsome life and a loving, sacrificial death. Calvin once said that the fruit of an innocent life is to find favor even amongst strangers. The book of Acts and the rest of church history testify to the thousands upon thousands of people who began to follow Jesus because they saw somebody who followed Jesus following him as they should. In other words, people became Christians because they saw Christians living like Christians. And they said, I want that. I want to follow Jesus. You know, a few weeks ago, I had a a couple young gals in our youth group share their testimonies. And after three of them, after a couple of them went, another young gal raised her hand and she she said, I just want to thank you guys for sharing uh, your testimony. I want to follow God better. And I want to know him better because of what you just said. Now, I could come up with a lot of incredible stories from church history to say that, the, that people get saved, people start coming to Christ because of our witness. That preaches louder than anything in my mind. To see teenagers witness and then to see another one say, I want to follow Christ like you follow Christ. That's awesome. See, when people fear us, favor us, they soon begin to follow us. That's not prophecy, it's kind of a principle. When people who once feared and said, whoa, whoa, wait a sec, God is in your midst, then become people who favor and say, you guys have treated me so nicely, I really enjoy being in your midst. Soon become people who who follow and say, I want to know the Christ that you talk about. I want to live that way. And that's exactly what we see in the text. The third and final way that they had an incredible impact was that the people followed. The people followed. Look at verse 47 in the middle of it where it says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Church, God was saving sinners unworthy of his grace and mercy. He was rescuing them into his church and he was doing it daily. And what you see here then is that devoted disciples lead to new disciples. Devoted disciples of Jesus lead to new disciples of Jesus and that is all to the praise of his glorious grace as he works in us and through us. 
people were coming to Christ in part due to the fact that the church wasn't so preoccupied with doing life together that they forgot to do life with others. They weren't so inward that they forgot about going outward. Their doctrine, church, listen, their doctrine didn't stifle evangelism. It, in fact, invigorated and fueled it. Their unity and their closeness, their intimacy as friends and people in the family of God, it didn't exclude others, but it was magnetic. And it compelled people to come in as they flew the doors open wide and said, friends, come join us. John Stott noted that their worship was daily and so was their witness. See, their evangelism wasn't sporadic or some occasional outreach that we're just gonna launch all this. It wasn't a program or a branch of ministry in the church. Church, it was their lifestyle. It was the culture of their body and fellowship to know Christ and to make him known. But what I want you to see, church, an eight-week trek through the mountains of Acts 2 has finally led to the most beautiful reveal in verse 47 that shows us the primary reason people were coming to Christ. And it wasn't, it wasn't because disciples were devoted. It was because God is incredibly gracious to use distracted disciples even when they're not devoted. <laughs> yeah, these disciples were devoted. They're, they're, yeah, they're exemplary. We should follow them. But it is so much less about the disciples and so much more about the God who is glorious and gracious whom they served. That's why Luke emphasizes that in the end of the verse, and the Lord added to their number daily. That is the absolute sovereignty of God in salvation. He did the adding because he did the saving. And the fact that he does the saving needs uh, to be stressed for two reasons, church. On one hand, for some Christians, some churches, evangelism is all about manipulative tactics to get the most numbers. When it comes to following Jesus, it's, it's never not a God thing. It's always a God thing. But sometimes we can think that it's an us thing. So we develop all kinds of tricks and gimmicks to manipulate people so they get saved. Now remember earlier I said the way that we approach this, we approach making impact is significant. Think about it. What are the two primary ways that well-meaning Christians and churches try to get people saved? On one hand, some focus on supernatural signs. On the other hand, some people focus on ensuring a favorable response of people. And so what you see is that fear and favor has erroneous extremes. And what you have in that, you have a, a misguided charismatic movement and a, and a misguided seeker-sensitive movement that has taken the focus and the emphasis off of being devoted to Christ and said, we want to make an impact before that. Now, I believe these people, these Christians, they are, genuinely want to make an impact for Christ. But, but those approaches are are unbiblical and their distraction can lead to devastating effects, whether that be being distracted by deceptive doctrine or being distracted by your rock star preacher as you attended the rock star concert and being entertained to death. Those are devastating results. And God can use them, God does use them. I trust as brothers and sisters in Christ, they, they can be used, um, but those are far from the ideal that God would have for us to reach the lost. In fact, in Acts 2, it gives us his ideal, his approach, where he would say, beloved, devote yourselves to me, to my word, to my people, to my table, to seeking my face, and then watch me work in you and through you. Now, that's one reason that his sovereignty and salvation needs to be addressed. The other is, is that God's sovereignty, it, it doesn't affect our need or the need to be urgent in evangelism. It actually reminds us that people can't be saved apart from us going and proclaiming the truth and the fact that we don't have time to waste. That's why Spurgeon's famous quote is perfect. He says, if sinners perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. 
So if today is the day of salvation for some, that means it has to be the day of of our proclamation for them. We can be mouthpieces of God's mercy. So church, how do you make an incredible impact on those around you in your life, your neighbors, your, your job, your family? You do it by laying it aside, all those distractions, and you become a devoted disciple trusting in the Lord to work. See, people will follow when we focus on Jesus, not when we focus on them. Our worship must precede our witness, but then as we go about witnessing, that ought to be our act of worship. Church, we can make an incredible impact on people's lives. And my challenge to you is this week, This week, I want to challenge you to worship God by having the gospel conversation with the person that you've been putting it off with for years, months, decades. Have that conversation. Trust in the Lord. Pray. Ask him for his help. But go to them in love and with gentleness proclaim the truth that Christ has come to save sinners like us and like them and that he is worthy of our worship. Our hearts must be motivated to reach the the lost and our minds must be equipped with an understanding of the gospel and our our feet must be available to go. That's probably the last one that we we struggle with. Yeah, I want to reach the lost. Yeah, I I know the gospel. I'm a little busy. (laughs) Sorry. Friends, you're not too busy to share the love of Christ with somebody, are you? No. Let's put off our distractions, myself included, and let's love those around us. Because when those things are true, then we can make an incredible impact for the glory of God. I just want to close our our, our series, our message and our series with these two final thoughts. I want to address you first corporately. When I began this study two months ago, I told you about a picture of my grandma that made me wonder if it was my sister all dressed up for an old-fashioned photo shoot. And that family resemblance was remarkable. And and over the last eight weeks, I've shown you a picture of your relatives in Acts 2. And the question is, Do you see the resemblance? Do you see the resemblance here in the church? Is there a resemblance? I want to challenge you. Praise God for the things that we are doing well. Think about those today. What are we doing well as a church? Let's praise God for his working in us in that way. But what are things that we've seen in this text that we don't do? Maybe, maybe, Maybe we're, we're struggling with them. What do we need to change? What do we need to grow in? What do we need to add or remove as a church? That's something for us to pray for. I want to encourage you to, to humbly pray and to vigorously work toward putting on what we've seen in Acts 2. And finally, I want to address you personally. I, won't, I, won't, I kind of want to say what I tell my youth groupers. Can I have your eyes? <laughs> this is very important. You know, at the beginning of each year, I, I often wonder and think to myself, I wonder who, who won't be here next year. That might sound a little morbid, I know, um, but I have the honor of doing the funeral services for the saints who pass away here at, at Cornerstone. And I've actually been thinking about this statement for months. I, I, I was, in God's providence, Karen's death now stands before us as a real stark reality that should preach to us very loudly. It's really likely that there's going to come a day where I sit with your family in your home after you have died and help them mourn and help them weep and help them remember the sweet times of your life. I'll talk to them about your life, about who you were as a kid, what you like to do, the things that that we just wouldn't know some of those fun ins and outs. But I'll also ask them, where were you with the Lord? 
can I see their Bible? Maybe I can, I, I like to, we like to use it to preach out of. Sometimes there's some very sweet marks in here. In fact, probably the most powerful sermon I ever preached was at a funeral where a woman had written um, a dedicated Psalm 23 right above it. She said, to all my family members now and into all future generations. And that preached because they were sitting right there. Church, I want to ask you, as individuals, where do you stand with the Lord? Do you know him? Have you repented? Have you turned to him? Do you see that life isn't merely, the Christian life isn't merely about coming to church and getting to go do everything else you want? Are you walking with him daily? Are you a devoted disciple? Or are you distracted? Are you even a disciple? Can I plead with you from the bottom of my heart, from the depths of my heart? Will you make it easy for me on the day that I sit with your family? <laughs> and say that your husband loved the Lord. Your daughter, she, she cherished Christ. Your father, your, your mother, I loved over the last year to just watch their lives transform. And then let me preach the gospel at your funeral to all the people whom you desire to reach right now. Will you let me do that? I, I want to be the kind of disciple I see here. I pray that you want to be the kind of disciple we see here. I pray that we want to exalt the kind of glorious and gracious God whom we serve right here. So I'm going to leave you with these words and that challenge that you would make the, the confession of the Rwandan man your own confession that says, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed vision, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I'm done with it. My face is set my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, and my way is rough, my companions are few, but my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I must go until he comes, give until I drop, preach until everyone knows, and work until he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he will have no trouble recognizing me because my banner will have been made clear. Amen. I'm a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ, all by his pure, sovereign grace and to the glory of his name. Church, cling to Jesus Christ and embrace the one who died for you that you might live for him in this way. Let's pray.